Hi. I hope you already had a good time listening to all the Kubernetes and container goodness in all the other talks. Today, I'm going to take you a little bit more back to basics. Uh, we're going to talk about how secure is your build server. And we're basically building up the story from code that starts on the laptop that ends up in the repository of your artifacts, which is ready to deploy to production. My name is Patrick Bois, and I currently work at Sneak and I work as the Director of DevOps Relations. Uh, many of you might know me from my work that I did at DevOps Days, and I tweet a lot about DevOps and DevSecOps related content these days. Um, and if you have any ideas or comments or feedback on this talk, uh, please find me uh, on the Twitter. So I'm happy to listen to your ideas. Like I said before, we're gonna start the journey from the laptop. Yeah. New developer gets a laptop. We already have a lot of trust going on. You trust the operating system, you trust the hardware, could have been changed, but that's not this story. And then you want to continue from there to development. The first step you do is you install all your tools and your tools might require some updates and you're already trusting the internet. Hooray, you would say. Kind of interesting that we don't usually consider this as part of becoming secure on the coding. It is an integral part because for those who didn't get the memo, installing package managers with a curl pipe bash script is not way to go. Look for binaries you can download and go from there. Uh, if you really want to still go that route, inspect whatever is happening in the script. It will learn what this is doing, especially if they advise you to do something like a pseudo execution to install things on your device. <coughs> Once you downloaded it, you can verify the checksums. Uh, very interesting. Not a lot of people do it. Um, it is usually on the website. Uh, if you are checking it, consider checking multiple sources because if the binary is compromised and the checksum is at the same location as the binary, they might have changed it. So look for multiple locations to verify the checksum that you downloaded. Sometimes it helps that you come to intermediaries that have done that work for you, that have uh, kind of had their own ecosystem, verified the binaries and verified the origin. Uh, things like the App Store, when you're actually downloading Docker through the App Store or to the signing from Apple, you're already trusting a third party to, by doing that. And in essence, a lot of this is actually trusting crypto, right? There's a lot of attacks, but it's the little things. OpenSSL is really important as a part, integral part, or all, any of the crypto libraries of keeping your laptop secure. One thing you might want to uh, ask yourself is, are your ciphers up to date? Some cannot answer that question. Look at how your system is configured. Is it like more open to the public or is it just the most secure bleeding edge ciphers that you do? You already trust those who set those configs. What about the protocol you're using? You know, Again, verify what you have on your laptop. Don't take it for granted. And even if you would not do that all the time, it's a good exercise to learn what's under the hood. So I advise you to learn by doing it. And eventually, all these tools rely on a central authority or a certificate authority that said, I trust the others. Do you know which one your system is trusting? Do you know which one of your updates starts trusting? Some of them are rogue, some of them are not rogue, so it's very important to keep those up to date and to know what is actually happening in that field. Good example is the defaults, whether that's Node or CloudFront or any of these ciphers, they're defaults, right? Look at them on how secure you want it to be. Um, some things are just not secure anymore, so remove those if you really want to take a look at that. And then even if you have keys, can you check that it's revoked or the certificate has been revoked? It's not an easy thing. Even curl has problems with it. Like we invented the CRL protocol, but it's not that much in use. So we've seemed to have favored instead of having these long lift certificates like long lift machines, we're going to ephemeral short lift and you know, uh, encrypt has been really instrumental in showing the way that it's like maximum 90 days or even shorter uh, certificates. 
and you know face it we're all doing the updates that's part that needs automation you know it happens to the best um, and another thing you can look at like who actually issued the certificate that you got so um, what helps there is the certificate transparency monitoring Facebook has a nice way to look at all the certificates that have been generated uh, check it for your own kind of domain and see what information actually gets leaked by doing that but also it gives you information of that maybe an other attacker is asking certificates for your domain and then we can go a step further in dns we can set which cas are allowed not many do that but it's again a new good practice to do uh, and limit the number of cas that somebody can uh, use to generate uh, our certificates so i told you before we're trusting crypto but we're also trusting a lot of dns and you know as my friend says everything's a dns problem but you know it is really complicated and we're not getting really better at it if you look at some of the major sites you know for example github doesn't use something like dnssec and that might worry you or not but it seems we're we're kind of like given up the browser are given up that the os level will take care of that they're implementing their own dns level so you know whether you check your system you have to start like at different places in your applications that you use as well because they're starting to do their own dns so it's not that central and more and more fragmented than you would expect so we, imagine we got the downloads we got the system updated to secure dns and kind of verified everything the next thing you'll probably do as a good developer is you're going to download some packages because you're not going to write it from scratch face it it's not economically anymore uh, whether that's your you know, base image you're downloading from scratch or your other thing, it doesn't matter. We're all downloading external libraries or dependencies. And that brings us to the fact that we actually start trusting them, uh, those binaries. We can think of them as technology, but they're also part of being human, right? Um, the Tim Book of Trucks brings us like four part pillars, like sincerity as part of trust, reliability, competence, and care. And we can actually apply that to a library. We usually evaluate libraries by looking how competent the library is. You know, technology people like to see how well they're doing. So the number of CVEs, does it have tests, you know, technical documentation, issues, number of issues, that shows you how competent the library is. So there's a lot of like evaluation going on beyond like, does it have a vulnerability? And then can we depend on it? Like, how long does it re uh, keep releasing stuff? Is there still something happening? Um, you know, we look at hints from other people, other uh, stars, contributors, they're always giving us like, can we uh, reliably depend on this dependency? And then how sincere is it? Imagine somebody writes the program, they're doing a cadence release, it's very well competent, but are they doing what they told uh, they would do? Like, is it still sincere uh, as a library? Uh, you know, code of conduct is another way of looking how sincere they are at uh, like exercising code of conduct um, uh, on the library. And then the third one we mentioned was care. Do they even care about others uh, using this library? Do they care about you if you have an issue? All about things that we are actually basically trusting people when we're trusting those dependencies. And, you know, kind of these things, because it's people, it kind of can get faked. You know, you can buy GitHub stars if you want to uh, kind of see that. So there's a lot of uh, subtle investigation that we're actually doing uh, as well. Beware if you install the library, somebody ha might have like, uh, you type it wrong. Uh, they kind of change the package name and they uh, allow you to insert something. So really look up the name of people uh, using the library instead of just trying to figure out whether it's node library or something and you get another library that you uh, expect it. And face it, these libraries don't just bring code. Like it's just about any of the package management systems bring scripts because after post install, pre install, they do things. So we're back at the pipe curl script, right? Look at those scripts again, stop blindly installing those packages and see what is happening. Or better yet, run it in a container, but we'll come back to that later. Obviously, they can do whatever they want in script. You know, this is a simple example of node installing advertising, on, uh, showing advertising on any install. But, you know, this is a, a friendly reminder that anything can be done by these scripts. If they you know, say they will wipe your hard disk, they can do it. So something to check, something to verify, 
uh, while you're using or selecting those new libraries. And sometimes they might still download things as well, like have they been uh, successfully and secure, uh, securing the download. Uh, so imagine your package JSON contains links to uh, parts of the libraries over HTTP that could be exploited as well. So something, another thing to check about. And we might not consider that, but you know, uh, ourselves in the Western world, but in China, for example, it's really hard to have uh, NPN verify the signatures because they're getting stripped out. So we, you kind of have to trust your trust, uh, uh, your proxies as well, uh, and verify they're actually downloading what you want them to do. And it is really hard. I'm not saying I w I'm doing this all the time. I just wanted to make you aware of the problems. That it is a real thing that we're trusting and verifying, and that will, will take some rigor for us to really get that uh, in a good shape. There's tools that help you, like Sneak, where I work for, a disclaimer that will check the dependencies, whether there are some known vulnerabilities. Uh, and I'm actually saying any code, whether that's your front-end code, your uh, typically uh, developer code. Uh, I'm not saying developer is not front-end code, <laughs> but you know, infrastructure as code is one of them, but also your config files, uh, like your Helm charts are code these days. Uh, your Infrastructure as code is um, code as well. So there are dependencies, libraries, modules that you use. And we can even start considering data as code, whether your password, you're checking in your config files, that is part of being code uh, being added. Uh, there's a lot of tools that are, allow you to check whether it's vulnerable, good practice, and so on. Start using those tools that will save you the hassle of having to do this manually every time yourself. And now we're ready to push our code, you know, after, you know, writing parts of our own code, assembling some parts of the others uh, and making that into a nice application. And we're ready to push our code to version control, right? So this time, are you still trusting your laptop? Well, yeah, I guess we have no things. We, we take some precautions. It can't be 100% safe, but, you know, let's move on to the process. So first thing you might not consider is, is your Git uh, kind of binary actually secure while doing this? So you, uh, or this is a friendly reminder to keep your tooling up to date every time. So we tend to keep our libraries of our packages more up to date than our tooling, but be aware that this is also a good thing for security to keep your tooling uh, updated. And when we push, you know, you can blindly push to GitHub, but did you actually verify the origin that you're pointing to? GitHub has SSA fingerprints, if you're using SSH, uh, to verify that you're pushing to the correct uh, server uh, and not somebody else's server that pops on, on the network. Uh, they also have a hashing mechanism that really helps you to verify whether the integrity of your push uh, is still good. They recently changed it, like, you know, verified, again, the, the, the protocols and the ciphers that you're using. SHA-1 is broken, so use a higher level for that. You can start signing your commits. It doesn't really help you with the security, but it helps others verify that it comes from, from you. Uh, so it's considered good practice. And you can take that a step further and start multi-signing with multiple people your commits. So if somebody compromises one person's laptop, the others can still have a say. And so you have this idea that one, uh, one person signing is almost like a single point of failure in that trust chain. You verify whether all the commits are signed, not only some. So that's a tool that can help you with. And you also want to verify who signed them. So it's not enough to say they're signed. <laughs> are you trusting actual the people that did sign them uh, as well? So imagine now we landed our code securely in our version control. What's the next step? And for many of us, uh, as the solo developers or a small team, they're pushing it to a SaaS uh, service, right? Uh, we're build, running our own build servers. It's considered, well, you know, not something you, you do that much anymore uh, in the cloud. You use one of the services or you have obviously your own service that you internally use, but you're basically offering uh, it as a service to the developer. And again, what you're doing is you're trusting their cloud. And whether that's Amazon scrubbing the disks when they give you a new disk uh, or you running inside of their containers, 
uh, all things that you are trusting while running uh, your tests uh, or your packages on the build service. Um, some ways of limiting who gets access to that or what access do your SaaS get is a good practice as well by IP addresses or use some kind of mechanism of tokens or kind of pseudo tokens like this AWS user agent uh, with random uh, kind of uh, keys. And what you actually want to have is uh, because you could not deal with any of the security that uh, is happening on the hood as a developer, you want to get visibility. You want to have the audits of what has happened to my code, who did what, and so on. So a, some people think that the CI system, it's all about running the tests and saying yes, no. You know, part of it is also seeing what has happened. And some CI systems are better than others to also exposing that information uh, to the developers. And then once you kind of build it on your uh, CI system, uh, that artifact needs to be signed, and which is interesting because you're actually signing it on a system that is more secure, less secure than your laptop because you have more control, less control on it. Uh, but obviously, you know, you kind of have to trust somewhere on that system and you push that artifact, whether you're, it's your container or your binary compile uh, to the artifact repository. But like I said before, the system might lie to you. You have no control over your CI system uh, and whether that's your tests are not um, representative or somebody's tampering with the results of your test, you have to be conscient that you as a person pushing that to the artifact uh, server with an in-between CI server is maybe something uh, that might not be that as secure uh, as you think uh, if you're uh, going that, that route. So the fact that we're buying a service or paying a service, is that getting us more trust? Uh, do we expect more trust? Do we actually know? Uh, it's an interesting question we can ask ourselves uh, while uh, doing that process. Uh, I asked the question, like, what do you think is more secure, the laptop, your own laptop that you can kind of control or the CI system that uh, somebody else controls? And it, it seems like there's, it depends, right? Is the one of those typical issues, but uh, there's not, you can't really say that your build server is more secure. It might get more attention, but if you give more attention or your laptop is security, that might be secure. So, but they, laptops do get to get that friendly, but systems get to have like centrally managed and also are centrally kind of, um, you know, controlled and uh, could be uh, probed uh, much more as a target as well. So what we actually want is transparency while we're building this and we want consensus like the multi-signing uh, that uh, I showed. And um, an interesting approach is what uh, the, the people who uh, built the core system for Bitcoin take, uh, like we did the multi-signing, they actually do the multi-build uh, of the system on different CI systems or they have people building it on their own laptop and see what the results are and then they can verify what the system actually produced and whether that's still in uh, a uh, binary that everybody's allowed to trust. That brings us to the fact that if you want to have this kind of reproducible build on several systems, uh, we have to kind of do a lot of work on that. And it's not that easy. Uh, Debian had like spent a lot of work in it, but trying to put, make a lot of the packages repeatable with binary checksums but uh, there's a lot of issues that can go in. Uh, whether that's time, your compiler flags, your compiler is different on several platforms, um, it might result in getting really hard. So, um, but it is worth it, I think, in the end, if we start doing this way more, because we can get the consensus and the transparency uh, that we want. Uh, example, people tried hard to get Node to recompile in a consistent way, but it seems now like one person will build it, then multiple people will sign it off on the binary, and then that checksum gets uploaded on the website. So what we want in the end is we want to know what source has made this binary possible. So very similar to your package JSON or your gem file lock, you have the list of packages checksums that has been built. But I think we can go farther. Uh, we can also track 
how the binaries are built, like every of the steps. We get that more and more with our Docker files, our CI files, uh, YAML files that we check in. And we can even go a step further uh, by securing that and tracking who did what. Was it you who built it or somebody else? So we want to re record who did what. Um, there's something called like uh, the update framework, uh, which Datadog has used in their kind of agent to secure how the updates get work. It's a very interesting process, but uh, requires quite some detail. So what they do is they limit authority, who can do what step. Uh, so that's one of the first things. Then they look for consensus, pretty much like the Git signing uh, um, and uh, the CI signing uh, on kind of any of the binaries that you check in. And then having the easy and fast revoke of access like we had uh, on the keys. And then some credentials should be harder to get at as others and not easily uh, to be gotten. And then we don't favor generic accounts. We want to hold everybody accountable for what they do in the process. So once we got all that information, um, it seems we want to recreate the binary, but for recreating the binary, we actually also want to recreate the build tool chain. I mentioned that before, we could run that into containers, uh, but something like Bazel starts uh, uh, listing the dependencies of the tool chain with which to compile or binary as part of the dependency management. Um, I found that interesting in a one step further of the reproducible uh, steps uh, of a binary. And now that all those dependencies have been recorded, it's also very clear that the more dependencies we have, the more vulnerabilities, possibilities we have. So what we're actually trying to do is reduce the number of vulnerabilities and dependencies that way. So Bazel, uh, for example, has been instrumental at the idea of distroless Docker images that built from the binary and that binary is completely independent built and uh, instead of relying on a base image, and then they kind of put the wrapper uh, around it. We can go one step further and not just look at our build chain, but look at our whole laptop as a container uh, uh, and kind of think ourselves as not just have disposable servers, disposable build containers, but what about disposable laptop environments? Uh, one um, interesting example is Cube OS, where you kind of spin up all your developer tools, which we've done a little before, but you actually download them as almost like a, a, a specific client. It's also used in journalism to make sure that nobody has tampered with the OS, uh, a nice side effect there as well. And more and more you see this trend as the developer laptop is running the cloud. And it's not just you know, gaming that starts in the cloud. Uh, it is also you know, your code space happening in the cloud, whether that's a, a standard build, a secure build. So it starts to get the same level of attention as security as the backend uh, gets or the production gets. And this tra traceability really helps us in making informed decisions. So if we know all the steps, who did what in the process, we can also base our decision whether something goes into production uh, on that information. And that's tremendously uh, useful uh, in blocking or allowing uh, new packages to go live on production uh, with that information. Uh, we can prevent it, uh, the pool, like an example, uh, but we can also use that information. Let's say a new vulnerability comes up. We know exactly what has happened, what has been used to build something in production. Usually this is only known at the OS level, but now we know all the dependencies, like the build chain, everything there. We can start tainting that uh, part where that code has been running and kind of move this slowly on. It's like train the other applications from that node. So all things we can start doing to get better at securing uh, that uh, environment. And yeah, okay, enough of the kind of droning, like we should this, that, that. There is a lot of things we can do. And I was just want to point out that uh, we can get at uh, things so much better uh, in that. But all this verification has a cost, right? And a lot of people talk about DevSecOps, like trust and verify, uh, but in a certain moment, you cannot do more and you just have to give up uh, control in a way uh, that you have to start doing real trust. Uh, because face it, 
we're always somewhere behind. Like one package will always be late or takes time to get approved uh, in the whole process. We're getting faster, but we will never get as fast. And I think that there's a similarity in, in where we used to have the assumptions like systems will never fail. Now we just have to assume failure. So the same thing is happening in, in vulnerability uh, package management that we would have to assume failure in those as well. And it's not because we don't see an issue uh, in security, that there are no issues. So if that's a, a, a typical trap you, you'll be able to fall to uh, when you look at your security. Um, and that brings us to the fact, are we actually, our CI systems, are they building confidence? And confidence is typically based on history. If it works today, it will work tomorrow, and will work the day after. If we're doing the same process, we're building confidence. But trust is more erratically, right? I trust the human and on different things than on confidence only. Uh, so are we actually uh, somewhere more starting to trust systems uh, or are we mistaking trust in our systems that they are able to deal with situations that we haven't controlled, that we haven't tested as well? You know, this will probably tie into resilience engineering and things uh, dealing with the unknown and observability as well. And as Mark Burke has put it in his promise theory, uh, security is a promise, right? Uh, a promise uh, can be broken and it will be broken. And uh, we can kind of howl into the woods and say, well, you know, it's not secure, it's not our fault. Ultimately, us assembling and working on it, we are the uh, kind of responsible for the security of things. It's like dependencies in production. Uh, if we depend on one system and that will fail, we have to bring in redundancy. And we need to do this in our development process as well, uh, on the library perspective. Look for alternate libraries, look for abstraction layers, kind of uh, go from there. Uh, the people at Pivotal, they kind of brought that even into their process. Uh, very much like our budget, they have something called a vulnerability budget. So they kind of track how many patches they're behind, how many things that uh, still need it or approval and they kind of put some bounds around it so if it reaches a certain level they will do an action uh, and they kind of uh, set the bounds uh, between it is allowed kind of to have insecure uh, things in production and this also applies for runtimes like what version of kubernetes would you be running can you be one behind is that a good idea how many versions can you be behind so kind of clarify that in a metric uh, as your legacy budget. In all these things, I think I've shown that um, making your build service secure is not only about making it technically secure, but it's also like putting your trust in the right place. And uh, one nice example uh, from Joel Ospaw uh, that shows that there's a relation between humans and security is in the question that he asked, like, how long can your system run without human interaction? Is that a day, a week, a month? So one needs the other. You, it's not only a binary uh, technical problem. Uh, so I, I think that uh, makes uh, this, uh, this presentation clear, I hope. Um, and even furthermore, like if you look at the sheer number of discussions we have, even if we did automate all the things in our CI pipeline, we're still having a lot of decisions to be made. And the systems help us build up the confidence and the trust is by the decisions of the humans in, in the process. So building a secure server is not any different than trusting a person. And I think transparency, who did what, uh, what time do we trust and the communication of that trust is instrumental in securing your build server. Um, and I think that's a different way of looking at it than just making it technically uh, secure or insecure. Technology helps us, it amplifies what humans want to do. Uh, and we have to look at that like that. We cannot see technology as standing alone and solving all the problems in that process. I want to thank you for listening to me. I hope it inspired you to do some more checking, some more verification, building some more like uh, kind of uh, learnings into the pod at looking at your uh, CI system, your laptop or anything between uh, for getting more secure. Um, and let me know uh, on Twitter or others 
if you have new ideas, additions, or uh, just want to say thank you for the presentation. Thank you for thinking with me, and I hope to see you next time again.